Hello, and welcome to Mythical Entertainment Interviews. I'm your host, Mithrandial. Today I'm joined by my colleague, Elliot, and we have the distinct pleasure of chatting with Ryan Morrison, otherwise known across the internet as the video game lawyer. We'll be discussing how he got started and the common mistakes indie game developers and other content creators make when it comes to their digital rights. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for taking the time today. I really appreciate you uh, carving out some time in your very busy day. Uh, I am joined today by uh, my colleague, Elliot. Hello. Uh, and we're just going to be asking some some questions about your practice and, and what got you into it. Um, so to get started, if you would like to introduce yourself and the work that you do, how long you've been doing it, and what directed you into this more niche element of the law. Sure. So my name is Ryan Morrison. I'm known on the internet and uh, read it as the video game attorney. But what that really means is I do a bunch of areas of law through the lens of video games. Mm. I work with, uh, I would say about 90% of my clients are either in esports or game dev. Uh, I am by no means the only attorney who does this, but we are, there's one of a handful, I'll say. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a pretty exciting niche field to be a part of, and I'm very, you know, lucky and honored to be part of it. I've been involved for about two and a half years now. Uh, From the legal side of things, I got involved with uh, Candy Crush trademark fiasco that made a lot of headlines Mm. uh, a couple of years back that many people might remember. Yeah. And before that I was working for a game development studio where I would do their trademarks and look at some contracts and things like that. All right. Awesome. What's the most challenging element of the type of law that you practice? Sure. So I think they're not anti attorney, but you'll find most game developers are attorney less, meaning they just never thought about getting one. Mm. So it's not that they don't, understand what a trademark is or it's not that they can't be explained what a trademark is but the entire culture is based around the idea that you don't need trademarks you don't need lawyers that suits are bad etc etc and it's all even you'll find that even at the very top level studios that they're not spending money where they should on legal protections because ah that's how the industry does it right and that's a bad reason and you'll see a lot of people getting burned left and right because of that right and so that kind of ties into to our next question which would be the most common issue that you find clients stumbling into? And, and would you say that it's the lack of, of legal awareness or lack of legal protection? I would say the, the, the yes, overall, the, you know, it's not, we have free consultations. Many attorneys have free consultations. And I would say the biggest mistake that a lot of attorney, a lot of game developers do is that they don't take us up on that. They don't come and have a conversation because mm-hmm. they would save themselves a lot of headaches. We get a lot of people coming to us when the world's already on fire a lot of the biggest problems they face, for example, would be under it, uh, the way a lot of relationships start is I'm a developer. I can't do art, but I have a really good game idea. I know you from a forum or you've been my friend for years or, or wherever, mm-hmm. and you're a great artist. So I'm going to give you $10,000. You design the art for my game. Everybody's happy. What they are not aware of is in that contractor relationship, the artist retains ownership of all that art. And without a proper assignment clause in the contractor agreement or without a contractor agreement at all, you'll find that these artists find out years later that they still own all those art assets and they're able to hold the game hostage down the line in a way that they shouldn't be able to, but that they are starting to do more and more often. Mm. Interesting. So, the, yeah, yeah I sorry. mean, there's a lot of issues like that. Yeah. I mean, just contracts save friendships and contracts save your business. There's a lot of people operating in partnerships without any kind of written agreement. Mm-hmm. There's uh, no one getting proper trademark protection at the lower levels when it would save them a lot of headaches when cease and desist letters come. Right. Because those cease and desist letters, you know, 20 years ago used to say, take your game down. Now they say, take your game down and give us $50,000. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's really, <laughs> that's, that, I, I was reading your uh, AMA the other day and you were mentioning, you know, how contracts save friendships. And it's so interesting to me that people could just continue on with that um, idea that, oh, we're friends. So, you know, it's all going to work out in the end because we're all going to hold hands and, and celebrate in this, uh, the success of this game together when things can go south so quickly uh, and nobody thought had the, had the foresight to bring contracts into it. it. It's almost as if, and you could probably speak to this a little bit more, I mean, it's as if people think that bringing in legality or contracts like questions the friendship in a way. Do you experience that with, is that yeah, some of the it's pushback? The same, it's the same mentality that you'll see with getting a prenup before a marriage. Mm. Well, why are we preparing for disaster when we want this to work? Yeah. But the, it's, it's even sillier here because 
you're not preparing for disaster. A lot of that contract says how to grow properly. It says how to make good decisions or, or what happens if nice things happen. So the contract isn't just a disaster piece. It's a, it's a, it's something that just governs the corporation or the partnership or whatever it might be. And it's very important. Yeah. So would you then say that as far as avoiding the fires, the first thing that you would tell any game developer to do is to draft up that type of contract? Yeah, I would, I would, uh, Absolutely say, speak to an attorney. There's a, there's a checklist I like to see that most hobbyists get before they start selling a product or call themselves, you know, a, a developer. That, that partnership agreement or operating agreement with your LLC or whatever it might be is absolutely very important. So is your trademark for your game and your company name. So is getting a contractor agreement because almost everyone in game dev works with a contractor at some point for something involved. And, uh, the terms of service and privacy policy are very important. That terms of service is 60 pages of nonsense that no one reads, but it's not nonsense. It's stuff that really protects you a lot from every kind of disaster. Mm -hmm. And the privacy policy discloses what you track, and it's no longer optional. The FTC is handing out fines left and right for having not proper privacy policies. Yeah, yeah, especially you, now. Yeah, Go ahead, Elliot. Do you find a lot of anti-intellectual property sentiment in the gaming community, whether it be towards copyrights, trademarks, or patents? Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a difference between myself and others saying the patent system needs to change or the DMCA is too easily abused or things like that with the other side that is just the intellectual property shouldn't exist. And you'll find those people, you know, they're loud and they're around, but they're not successful and they, they certainly won't be because they're not they don't believe in selling products. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's just they're, they're not they're not clients I work with right. by any means. Yeah. Um Quick question. So what do you think is the the biggest unresolved digital rights issue that's that's going on right now? I know there are a lot of uh, cases going on that people might not be aware of. Is there one that you're really keeping an eye on that you think could have a serious impact on the work that you do? Yeah, it's not even that we watch cases necessarily because 99.9% .9 of the time they get settled and we don't get any kind of result when we really wanted one. Mm. The thing I'm I'm most curious about currently that I, I do want to see answered sooner than later is uh, the let's play videos. So when you make with, with copyright, there's a difference between transformative and derivative. If I make a piece of fan art or something like that, it's almost certainly derivative and it's, it's infringing and you can shut it down if you want. Mm. If I add enough of my own special sauce to it, where people are coming for my thing, not for yours, it, it hits a point eventually where it's transformative. So, you know, if you look at Jason from Friday the 13th, and Mike Myers from Halloween, they're both serial killers in a mask who walk slowly towards their victims, <laughs> but there's enough difference between them that it's transformative. Yeah. You don't look at one and see the other. Right. So that's the same it, it, for, throughout copyright world. The problem with Let's Play videos is they're insanely popular, but they're probably infringing by modern copyright law. Mm -hmm. So Nintendo has famously said you can't do Let's Play videos unless you give us a cut, unless you do this, this, and that. And people have just kind of said, okay, then we're not going to do Nintendo Let's Play videos. <laughs> yeah. As a result, though, that's created industry standard and precedent that these companies can shut down Let's Play videos. So it, it's possible that one of the highest grossing parts of the game industry right now is entirely illegal. Mm. Now, would you also apply that to Machinima when, for instance, um, Red vs. Blue, where they took the parts of Halo and created their own story using those characters? Was so, that yeah, I mean it's it's definitely in the same ballpark. Where that line is is really hard to say, but I would be shocked if Red vs. Blue didn't have a proper license from Bungie or whoever owned the IP at that time. Right. But it it uh if you or I made that, I would I could they could shut you down pretty easily, I would guess. Yeah. And and it's funny because I think that uh if I recall and I may have to go back and look at this, but I, I believe Rooster Teeth actually got Bungie's blessing. Um you know, when they were doing those videos, which is why it didn't garner a lot of that attention. But strangely, if, if somebody tried to recreate that formula now, not only would uh, Bungie be after them, but most most likely Rooster Teeth would be as well because they've established themselves um, to the point where where that's kind of their niche as well. So right. it's kind of interesting how that evolves. Um, and then there's there's this whole new realm kind of emerging very quickly uh, and you mentioned this briefly before that you represent a lot of esports uh players um and esports is rapidly growing as an industry uh what are some of the biggest issues that you see coming out of that community and how do you think this will evolve as esports continues to grow as as it has been in the last couple of years 
Sure. So a lot of money came in real fast with esports, and it was completely unexpected, and and no one really predicted it properly. Uh, so when that happened, there was not a lot of lawyers there. There was not a lot of accountants there. There's certainly no regulation there. The companies who own these games like Valve and Riot and Blizzard weren't putting in the proper amount of time or energy to police the games. I still don't think they are. Mm. And as a result, you found a lot of people with a lot of money taking advantage of young kids. So, yeah, I mean, they're over 18. They're adults. These players are usually between 20 and 25. But that doesn't mean that they should just be left to the wolves. And in many cases, they were. These uh, these big investors would come and say, well, we're going to put you on this team. We're going to get you involved. And next thing you know, he they win a tournament and they never get paid. The the uh, the company comes and uh, just keeps the money and never sends it their way. And is this another? In their case, this is another instance of just contracts just not being made. These players feel like the right boxes are being checked just because the company says, "Oh, we're going to take them into their." Yeah, room. I mean, I have cases of owners. I have I have cases of owners specifically saying, "If you talk to an attorney, you're off the team." So it's it's it, it crosses over from just bad legal knowledge into just straight up criminal charges unethical yeah extremely right now a a lot of sports law tends to be different than well just major uh contract law do you think sports law is going to bring esports under that umbrella or do you think esports is just going to be treated as straight entertainment I think it has to be a bit of both and then a bit of a third thing, which is just internet law. You know, when we're negotiating those contracts, one of the most important thing is streaming rights or things that certainly no one in the NBA cares about. So it's it's a little bit of a different world that way. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's going to have to be a, a mixture between all of those. Um, I actually have a follow-up question on... Sure. We were talking about digital rights. Um, we're talking about doing let's plays but even in the more narrow situation where somebody creates a user map for a game i know there was um, a big problem when dota 2 tried to come out using uh with valve instead of going through it with blizzard and they had a whole trademark dispute but do you see user maps as one of those situations where the games industry is actually cutting down on creativity when you you mean when users make their own maps for these games Right. So how much, basically, how much rights does a user have to their maps when they create them? Basically zero, I would say. I mean, unless you're making it completely for your own game and your own workshop, uh, most of those terms of service and end user license agreements you click OK to say anything you make is going to be owned by them. Uh, so with that in mind, it's, it's, uh, it's important to realize that there is a line certainly where you might transform something, but there's not necessarily a line ever that you're going to be making something in someone else's game and then own it. So that whole Dota League uh, Blizzard issue was was a a big one. But again, it was settled outside of court, so it's not like it created any kind of precedent. So what types of aspects are going to be owned by Blizzard? So for instance, if I'm creating a map and I create my own characters with my own story, but I do use you know their models and I use their attacks, if I just want to pull the character and the story out later to create my own game, Am I going to lose those rights to Blizzard? Possibly. I mean, it's it, that's a harder argument. It's hard to own a story. It's hard to you can't own a genre or a mechanic or anything like that. So there, if you're using the exact same names and things like that, it's potential. It's those are potentially their property as they were used in their game to to market a, a map or something like that. So shifting away from from the work side of things, uh, I know that you're a super busy guy, but. Um, just generally, are you playing anything right now? Um, or alternatively, uh, would you like to share what your favorite video game is? Yeah, so I, I actually am, uh, speaking of all those games, I, I play Dota pretty religiously, although I've switched over to Heroes of the Storm because I, I am busy and it's quicker 20-minute games, very casual. Mm. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I, I'm a big fan. And, you know, growing up, I, I'd say probably my favorite game ever. It's a little cliche, but it was Final Fantasy VII. Uh, that game was really amazing, showed you what a game could be, and, and the story is better than any book or movie I've seen to date. Wow. Yeah, and so I'm guessing you're going to be getting the, the remake on the PS4 then. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm waiting anxiously for that to arrive. Um, all right, well, Ryan, thanks again for your time. I just want to give you an opportunity to make your uh, uh, closing argument, so to speak. Um, 
you know, maybe uh, some great resources for potential game devs, how people can contact you, and maybe any other notable events that you wanted to let us know about to help educate people who are want venturing into this, you know, uh, kind of scary legal world of, of digital rights. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the most important thing is to talk to an attorney and talk to an accountant. I can't help you on the second thing, but I very much can help you on the first thing. If you Google video game attorney or video game law, I'm the top results. So just give me a shout and uh, we'll go from there. It's it's always worth it to have that conversation. You're not going to get charged for it just to see where you're at and see what you need mm. and really take this stuff seriously. You know, you can save yourself a ton of money and a ton of headaches by doing this now as opposed to after. All right. Well, Ryan, thanks again. We really appreciate you taking the time today to chat a little bit about what you do, and we look forward to seeing more from you. No problem. Happy to do it, and uh, thanks for having me. You bet.